Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our second Toolkits Poetry Live session. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri and Bunwarung people of the Kulin Nation. Um, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respects to elders past and present and ask that uh, everyone tuning in to maybe just think about or reflect on the um, land that they're listening from. Um, this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I would also like to thank our partner Australian Poetry and sponsor the Copyright Agency for their support. So for those who don't know, Toolkits is a program for writers 30 and under to develop their skills over the course of 12 weeks. In the poetry sessions, our group has been learning different forms and techniques around poetry in a mixture of workshops and one-on-one -on -one feedback sessions. It's an amazing opportunity for young writers to connect uh, to their community and learn new skills in their chosen literary form, um, which is in a really kind of fun and supportive environment. And tonight um, for our live session, uh, we are very lucky to have a brilliant poet talk to us, Ella O'Keefe. Ella is a poet and researcher who grew up in Sydney, but now calls Melbourne home. She is the author of Rhinestone, which was published by Stale Objects Depress, and a collaborative chapbook called It's What We're Already Doing with the Muddle, Buddy Paloma, Emily Stewart, Sean Bate, and I have a couple of poems in there too. Um, she was the 2015 winner of Overland Judith Wright Poetry Prize, joint winner of the 2018 Harold Tribe Poetry Award. Ella holds a PhD in Literary Studies from Deakin University and has worked in libraries and universities and also radio. Her forthcoming collection, Slolia, will be published by Cordite Books, I believe, later this year, which I'm very looking forward to reading. Um, so Ella's going to be talking to us about the poetry of the everyday, um, which is a topic I'm also very interested to hear more about. Um, and uh, the, tool, the hashtag you can follow on Twitter is hashtag EMToolkits. Um, so we'll have questions at the end, probably about 15 minutes, um, that Ella's going to answer for us. And I will be back then. But for now, uh, over to you, Ella. Thanks so much, Eleanor, and thanks to everybody who's um, joining in. Um, I'd also like to say that I'm uh, sitting now on the lands of the people of the Boomerang and Woiwurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation. Sovereignty was never ceded, and I would like to acknowledge the ongoing and unbroken Aboriginal custodianship of and jurisdiction over this land uh, and the stories that, that it holds. Okay, so the theme this week um, is poetry of the everyday, and um, I'm going to talk mainly about uh, some North American poets from kind of the mid-century, um, broadly known as the New York School, um, as a way of uh, looking at kind of, yeah, poets who were very interested in how how, ways that they could use the quotidian, that is the everyday um, and ordinary experience as material which helps us write poems. Um, of course, this technique isn't just limited to the New York School poetry, but hopefully um, looking at some of these poems will also give you some inspiration for ways, new ways that you might begin to think about um, how to write a poem or what what exactly is poetic material, what what's allowed to be in the poem and what um, which I think in the case of many of these poets is kind of everything. Um, and I would say these poets, um, their work has and continues to shape um, a large amount of English poetry, including poetry not only in America, but also um, Australian poets uh, writing now. Um, okay, so I'm going to enter into full screen because I've got some snazzy pictures. <clears throat> so, so I want to begin by saying initially that calling these poets a school, the New York School, which is, you know, how they're referred to um, in a lot of uh, literary scholarship, is a slight misnomer. The term, I mean, I would say there isn't really such a thing as a New York School in a formal sense in terms of um, rules or strict styles that these poets are, are following. 
Um, for me, the idea of the New York School suggests something more like a community of, read of readers, that is a grouping that is both literary and social. Um, there are, of course, some shared preoccupations amongst these poets who all kind of were encountering one another at the same time um, and in the same place initially, which was New, New York. Um, and it does make our job as readers of poetry and poetic history easier to use a term like the New York School to designate this like as a kind of shorthand. Um, but I would just say don't get too caught up in, in rigid definitions of, you know, what is and isn't. New York School, etc. Um, generally, the term refers to several generations of poets who were writing in North America um, and New York in the mid 20th century. So from the 1950s onwards, with a kind of real explosion of work happening, um, publications and, and collaborations um, throughout the 50s, 60s and 70s. The best known um, iteration of the of the New York School of the kind of first generation are the poets John Ashbery, Frank O'Hara, Kenneth Koch, James Schuyler and Barbara Guest and I know that maybe um, you guys have already looked at some of O'Hara's work in previous weeks so you might have already some sense of um, where we're heading. Um, so these are poets who lived and wrote uh, in New York some of them, although some of them um, from, sorry, from this time but um, some of them definitely had much longer writing careers, you know, some, some some of the New York poets we'll mention tonight are still writing now and well into the 21st century. So again, it's not necessarily confined just to this um, particular historical period. And while O'Hara, Ashbury, Coke, Guest and Schuyler are maybe the best known of the so-called first generation, there were also many other poets um, associated with the New York School um, and including a kind of generation of younger poets who are sometimes called the second generation of New York school um, poets mm -hmm. uh, who were writing more um, into the 70s, 8, 70s and 80s. Um, and I think their work, um, as we'll, we'll look at um, tonight, we'll look at James Schuyler, but also Bernadette Mayer, and if there's time, Alice Notley, um, Mayer and Notley both being kind of second generation New York, New York school poets. Um, and in these young, the second generation, I think sometimes you find that their poetry is tracking more closely um, with politics of the time, with the counter, with counterculture, political uprisings of the 60s and 70s. Um, so just to give you a sense of some of the people that are in this general zone, um, people like Ted Berrigan, Ron Padgett, Alice Notley, Bernadette Mayer, Eileen Miles, Anne Waldman, Kathleen Fraser, Frank Lima, Leroy Jones, who later um, wrote and published as Amiri Baraka, Joe Brainard, Kenwood Elmsley. There's a whole lot. So um, once you, if if this style of poetry, uh, if you like what you encounter tonight, I do encourage you to go out and and look. Um, there's a lot of wonderful writers associated with this kind of time and movement. Um, so again, I'm just the, I have a little bit bit of context, um, further context, and then we will get into some of the poems. But um, in terms of trying to get at, you know, the forces that were, you know, producing what we think of as New York school writers, I wouldn't say there's a single sort of predecessor or, or a logical kind of, you know, genealogical line that they're following. But the New York poets certainly read widely. But as I said, they were writing, um, beginning to write and publish in post-war America um, at a time when there was a kind of influx of migrants from Europe um, following the wake of World War II coming into New York. So this, um, the kind of ideas and uh, particularly ideas, I guess, about modernism that, that um, migrants from Europe, uh, painters, filmmakers, philosophers, composers, um, were bringing into into li the literary world and the artistic world at the time and into New York um, are certainly one kind of important factor in thinking about um, what it is, some of the things that are um, influential to the poets that we're talking about tonight. Um, you know, I would also say that um, the influence of American modernist poets, people like Wallace Stevens, Ezra Pound, William Carlos Williams in HD, Gertrude Stein, etc., are important touchstones for the New York School poets, um, as well as um, surrealist art and poetry, and especially um, French 
um, French surrealist poets um, and, and the Beat Generation, you know, people like Allen Ginsberg, who's definitely in the mix. Um, and so there is this, you know, modernist interest in experimentation with poetic form and with abstract forms, but at the same time, um, with the New York School poets, you find that there's a kind of equal appreciation for, you know, so-called high art and and pop culture. Um, and you're as likely to read in their, find in their poems a discourse on, you know, contemporary art as you are a kind of recounting of going to see the latest um, Hollywood movie, the lunchtime matinee or, um, you know, a pay into Lana, Lana Turner. Um, opera is mixing with advertising jingles in, in the terms of the New York School kind of cultural reference. Um, and this, they're really, you know, despite absorbing modernism and remaining interested in it and in, and in the um, invitation to experiment that it represents, a lot of these poets were also seeking to write in more direct and playful ways. Um, but when I say direct, I don't really mean that they were were writing earnest confessional poetry in the vein of, you know, other poets around at the time like Sylvia Plath or Anne Sexton. Um, New York poetry is definitely sometimes personal, but I don't think a lot of the time it's written with the view to being a form of catharsis, as we might find um, in more kind of confessional forms of poetry. There's always um, irony, humour or, or like a measure of self-awareness which kind of offsets the weight of the confessional gesture. Um, I think the poetry of the New York School is also marked by a kind of immediacy which attends to the momentary, a sense that the poem is trying to keep up with the hubbub of the world and the movement of the poet's consciousness as they take in the sensations of daily life. Um, there's very much, I think, you'll find when, when you read these poems, um, you can kind of feel the thoughts as they occur um, being set down immediately on the page, uh, things as they happen out the window. Um, and as well as this immediacy, I also think a lot of New York School poems uh, have a certain quality of intimate address. They're conversational, they're unfiltered, they're maybe even gossipy. Um, and again, that's you know, being intimate, I think, is different to to being confessional. It's always this kind of self aware irony that um, stops stops the endeavor becoming too severe or too serious. Um, and I think the intimacy of the poems is also, you know, a result of the soci sociality um, of these poets um, of the way it works. So, you know, poems are used as a way to circulate it as an act of friendship. Um, Often they're dedicated to specific individuals um, or addressed to them or mention a whole bunch of friends, you know, uh, in in the text of the poem. They can almost be a little bit in-jokey. Um, and the other, the other word I would use um, to describe the quality of some of them is epistolary. So sharing um, sharing things in common with with the letter and of course, when many of the New York School poets weren't writing poems, they were writing letters to one another, and those letters contained poems. Um, a lot of the poems were public, were sort of had their first airing in pub in public. I guess it's private public um, through correspondence, through through letters, um, and so there's a kind of almost a bleeding of forms. Like sometimes you can't tell the difference between. Um, um, between the poem and the letter. These are some uh, postcards from Barbara Guest's archives. Um, I thought I'd read, give you an example um, of a poem that James Schuyler wrote to his friend Frank O'Hara in 1954. I'll just read a couple of paragraphs, but you can definitely see that um, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of poetic letter. Um, Fair slender bow. Greetings from the Adriatic Pearl. It's marvellous here. I'm delighted to be here and don't want to hear another word about Austria. All that's lacking is yourself, tripping between the pigeons and the cats. I'm really so foolishly pleased with such vast extents of Venetian art that it's falling into a bottomless pit of delight. I can't tell you how my, eggs, how, <laughs> how my legs ached last week or what's more remarkable, how little I minded. The high aesthetic life doesn't, alas, make for lively letters. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely 
It's definitely a letter where he's sort of telling O'Hara about his travels, but it's also carefully written and crafted in the way that you might um, craft a poem. And I think the more you read their poems, you also see sometimes that their poems resemble letters as well. Um, and the fact that the poems were published in postcards and letters rather than, you know, books or, or um, serious literary journals, um, again, underscores the way that poetry is part of the fabric of kind of social life um, for many of these poets. Writing poetry is part of living. Um, and in this way, the author isn't a kind of, you know, genius in a garret disconnected from the world um, outside the material and domestic concerns of what to eat and who to eat it with. Um, they're very much, you know, it's uh, when the gossip magazines have celebrities, they're just like us. I think the New York School poets are kind of going on, you know, even though the poems can be transcendent in their way, it's like the poet is a person. Poets, they're just like us. Um, yeah, and so the circulation of po of the poems certainly acts through letters is um, acts of love and friendship in a gift economy. The sharing of the poems creates the community of readers. Um, another letter to Barbara Guest. They had such a nice handwriting. Another kind of important thing to think about um, when you're trying to sketch out a context for, for the New York School of Poets was that many of them, or almost all of them really, were tapped into um, socially and intellectually with the art, with the New York art scene of the time, um, you know, friends with and and indeed considered kind of painters to be in part their, their main audience um, at a time when, you know, the poems they were writing weren't um, weren't necessarily being published in uh, mainstream literary journals and so there was kind of um, an attempt to go and seek seek the audience who was actually interested in what they were writing and um, apart from you know the other poets of the New York School this this was also painters um, particularly painters associated with abstract expressionism but again not exclusively um, I'm thinking of people like Grace Hardigan, Helen Frankenthaler, Mary Abbott, Elaine and William de Kooning Robert Motherwell, Joan Mitchell, Larry Rivers, um, many others. Um, <clears throat> and their friendship with artists and their intellectual interest in art, you know, all of the, for example, the first, the poets I mentioned that are part of the first generation um, of the New York School, you know, also wrote art criticism as well as poetry um, and certainly took art as a common theme um, in their poetry. Um, they also collaborated directly with artists. Um, works like, this is a later work, this is Barbara Guest and Mary Abbott, Honey or Wine, and this is a kind of poem painting. So this is, you know, the poet and the painter have gone into the studio and kind of Guest's poem is, you can't really read it, but it's um, written out on strips of paper and then it's actually adhered into the surface of the painting. Um, and then there's a, a series of lithographs called Stones, um, which was with visuals or artwork by Larry Rivers and um, poetry by Frank O'Hara. And I'm mentioning the collaborations because, again, I think they show how methods of painterly composition, um, the way that these painters who were kind of forging a new um, form of visual expression, um, informed the approach to poetry um, for many of the New York School poets, um, namely through an emphasis on process and um, materiality. To kind of badly paraphrase James Schuyler, he said that you'd never get New York poetry until you realise the gallons of paint flowing through it. Um, and so when we think of abstract expressionist painting, you know, all those painters I mentioned, um, Jackson Pollock is kind of one of the the best known painters, I think, to have, yeah, works like uh, Helen Frankenthaler here. Um, we're talking about artists who were working with paint and canvas in non representative ways. So, you know, Frankenthaler was known for kind of the way she would pour paint on in soaks and stains and kind of produce these washes of colour. Um, so, and painting in this way means the painter is spontaneous. They can't predict 
the overall outcome of the painting. Um, you know, it's the difference, there's a, the d difference between drawing a line that is meant to represent a tree or a bowl of fruit and pouring a puddle of paint on the canvas and seeing how it behaves and seeing what comes out of it. And so this sort of emphasis on process and materiality um, offered a model for a way of writing the poem, um, which was appealing or which um, New York School poets took up, one where the event of the work is the moment of its making and, and the making of the poem is sometimes part of the subject of the work. So the artist or poet does not need to know how the poem or, you know, does not need to know what the poem will be about or what the painting will depict before they start making it. Instead, painting and poetry um, can be about a process of experimentation with materials, whether that's paint or language. And the work is kind of a document of the process of its own composition. So qualities of spontaneity, being open and receptive to the various directions in which a work can develop are kind of central ideas. And um, this is where the connection between these painterly metal painterly models um, for composition, for writing a poem, which, em which emphasize composition, which emphasize, sorry, which emphasize the process of composition, um, connect to poetry, which is informed by an idea of the poem um, as an experiment and as a duration, not as an object. Um, and obviously in this idea of the poem as a kind of duration, um, we can see how that feeds back into um, bringing the everyday, bringing what's around you at the time of the making, at the time of the writing of the poem, bringing that onto the page. It means you can start writing in the middle of things and bring in all the thoughts, experiences and conversation fragments that are immediately to hand. Um, maybe one of the, you know, clearest examples of this is... Um, a work like Frank O'Hara's Lunch Poems, um, where there are many poems, where, where a lot of the poems were just um, written in written in O'Hara's lunch hour. Um, so he's sort of, yeah, the, the grand act of writing the poem is actually threaded into the activity of eating lunch and carving out a piece of leisure in the working day. Um, I was going to read a line, but maybe we'll do that afterwards because I'm a bit worried about time. Obviously, as we've, as I've been saying the word New York a lot of times, um, the city of New York itself is a locus, is a kind of locus of experience um, in many of these, particularly the early poems. Um, it is an environment which brings the poet immediately into contact with with things, with people, with experiences, with friends, with enemies and potential new conquests um, around, you know, around every corner there's there's something new to encounter and something new to um, go into the poem, um, whether it's, you know, a painting in an art gallery that's, that stops the, stops you in your tracks or um, a surreal juxtaposition of, of a neon sign um, and a billboard. Um, and, again, that mixing of high and low culture that I mentioned earlier, I think that is also... Um, enabled by the kind of urban environment, like moving through a large kind of urban city, um, you are just encountering everything kind of butting up against, um, butting up against everything else. Um, <clears throat> I guess this is a term that is most applicable to O'Hara, um, but I thought it was interesting to mention um, this idea of the flaneur, which is a, a French word which uh, kind of arose to describe figures in 19th century um, French literature, um, so yeah, at the, the beginning of kind of modern modernity, um, who observed and wrote about the street life of Paris, um, particularly Baudelaire, um, Charles Baudelaire, the French poet Charles Baudelaire, um, was described as a, as a kind of flaneur um, of the streets of Paris. And it, and it basically the word comes from um, a French word, fl flaneur, the noun, which has the be basic meaning of a, st a stroller, um, but also kind of has implications of loafing and sauntering. So the flaneur is someone who strolls the city for the purpose of pleasure and observation, um, not in the service of productivity. So they're not in the city to work. 
Um, they're kind of alone in the crowd, but um, you know, observing observing the crowd. Um, and so I think we can think of O'Hara and maybe some of the other New York school poets at times as being kind of um, flanners of New York. And I mention it because I guess um, it's a you know, going out and having a go at being a flaneur wherever you are. I understand that um, not everyone watching this is necessarily living in a big city, but um, just applying the principles of, you know, a poem, trying to write a poem that simply um, you begin it actually not by putting your pen to the page. You begin the poem by going and taking a walk away from your desk, um, by looking out the window, by carefully observing what's around you. And before you know it, you're actually writing a poem without even um, without even having to to face down the blank page. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is um, the relationship between politics and New York school poets, because um, I think there's a few interesting kind of, I want contradictions is maybe too strong a word, just an interesting um, maybe correlations is more what I mean. Um, so as I said, the, the first generation of New York school poets are writing and publishing in, um, you know, the 1950s. So we're talking kind of post-World War II, um, rel you know, peaceful and comparatively prosperous years for America, but also socially conservative in many ways. Um, you know, you think of the 50s and you think of the idealization of the nuclear family. You think of um, how the kind of conflict of World War II was um, shifted or translated or became um, the kind of Cold War and McCarthyism, the kind of anti-communist sen sentiment that was dominating politics at the time, which in practice meant that many people or groups seemed to have radical or, you know, anti-establishment ideas or to live their life in a way that deviated from these fairly conservative social norms um, were vulnerable to being persecuted. Um, and I mention this because, you know, among the in the first generation um, of the New York School poets, Frank O'Hara, John Ashbery and James Schuyler were all gay. And we see in their poems, um, as we'll see in their poems, um, their writing was really a place where they were able to express and explore their sexuality. Um, and so thinking about the first generation um, poets who were writing kind of 50s and in the 50s and early 60s. Um, they're writing in a way before and then through and after, um, obviously, the kind of large uh, mass social social movements and political uprisings um, that, are, that are happening later in that century, um, civil rights, gay liberation, women's liberation, the anti-Vietnam war movement um, and the countercultural movement generally. And I think sometimes, um, yeah, New York school poetry and say abstract expressionist painting, certainly maybe more so than poetry, um, gets, is, is sort of considered to be apolitical, um, purely aesthetic. Um, but I do think even, you know, even with these early poets who are certainly not, um, not as engaged, not as directly engaged in political projects in their writing as some of their peers and contemporaries. Um, at the same time, the expression of um, the everyday experience, the making visible the everyday experience of, you know, gay men, of women in the case of Barbara Guest and certainly um, in the case of later um second generation writers like Alice Notley, like Bernadette Mayer, like Eileen Miles, um, does constitute a kind of a form, a, a, a um, form of political expression. Um, you know, there is something, there is something political to writing poems that are simply about your everyday experience, the everyday experience um, of gay men and women in a culture that was deeply closeted and that was upholding very traditional notions of gender roles um, and, and the kinds of lives that were possible for women. So um, while, yeah, while politics is not, I think, um, at the forefront, um, although, again, because the poems are kind of about everything that's going on, of course, politics and news of the day are um, 
entering into the poems as things that the poet is thinking about and engaging in the world. But I also think that there is a kind of political impetus that we can locate in expressing the everyday um, experience um, of, you know, of the individuals who, who were part of this poetry scene. Um, and on that, you know, the on the idea of the kind of closeted culture, I think also here again we come back to the kind of letters and in the informal circulations um, of, you know, artistic expression as a way to create spaces um, and, and a readership, uh, spaces for expression and a readership at a time when mainstream literary and social establishment was um, either not receptive or, or actively hostile. Um, so in this way, we can see that while the subjects of some of the poems may be, you know, quote, minor, you know, they're about friendships, they're about lunches, they're about trivial occasions, which is different to like a kind of modernist, heroic notion of great works of art writ large. Um, they're also about making visible the everyday um, of ways of living which were suppressed by prevailing social norms. So on that note, and after a slightly um, wordy introduction, I think let's read some of the poems and hopefully um, that will give a bit of context to some of the things that I've been talking about. So I wanted to start um, with some poems by James Schuyler. We'll just read, I've got a few on the slideshow, maybe I'll read one in full um, and a few lines from the others. Um, so James Schuyler, part of that kind of first generation um, of New York school writers. Uh, maybe we'll start with the blue towel. Uh, am I missing a bit of the anyway. Went to the, went with us to the beach, a blue towel. Went with us to the beach. You drove the green bomb, your panel truck, sand dunes and signs. No parking between signs, prohibited on this beach, hardball, intoxication, bonfires, mist and filterable sun. Oh, breakers and leaping spume. We spread the towel where we where we where we could lie and watch the fierce and molten wonder of the water. You wore blue trunks and took off a striped Roman shirt and kicked off Gucci loafers, and you think I'm hard on clothes. We lay and watched and smoked. I studied sand and the sand-like freckles on your back and smaller than small, one blackhead later removed and thought beach thoughts after sex. Man is sad, some Roman said. Did he mean because the pleasure's over? It's the day after last night and I am anything but sad. Quiet, content, a little tired. We do go on so. Then we walked, you in the surf, I on scoured sand, firm and running to escape the waves that almost got on my sneakers. Then we walked back, your trunks were partly wet as though you'd pissed your pants. I think, you said, I'll go in after all. Then there you were bobbing in breakers, leaping high to ride their great and breaking crested curl. It scared me, a lousy swimmer, just a little. That's the way, you said when you came out. I like it, it's almost warm enough. I saw your chest and side beside me, pearled with water drops. The mist moved off. We sat and sunned. It was late, no tan today, and watched the repetitions of the sea, each one different from the last, and saw how a log was almost hurled ashore, then taken back, slipping north along the shore. The flies were something else. These insects are too much. Let's go back. The blue towel and your trunks, I hung out on the line. You took a shower, I made drinks, quiet ecstasy and sweet content. Why are not all days like you, happy with someone and that someone you, together on a blue towel, on sand beside the sea? Um... And maybe I'll just read a little bit. Uh, so that was from Skyler's collection, Hymn to Life, 1974. And I'll read just a little bit of Hymn to Life, um, which is a long, um, several, page, several pages long poem in that same collection. Um, the wind rests its cheek upon the ground and feels the cool damp 
and lifts its head with twigs and small dead blades of grass pressed into you as you might at the beach rise up and brush away the sand. The day is cool and says, I'm just staying overnight. The world is filled with music and in between the music, silence and varying the silence, all sorts of sounds, natural and man-made. There goes a plane, some cars, geese that honk, and not here, but not so far away, a scream so rending that to hear it is to be never again the same. Why, this is hell. Out of the, de out of the death breeding soil here rise emblems of innocence, snowdrops that struggle easily into life and hang their white enamel heads toward the dirt. And in the yellow grass are small wild crocuses from hill goats have Wild crocuses from hill goats have cropped in barrenness. The corms come by mail, are planted. They do their thing to live, to live so natural and so hard. So I think in both those poems in different ways, um, you kind of get a sense of, you know, the way Skylar is using um flowing lines, um, the sense of thoughts and moments merging into one another and the poem is one kind of continuous experience. I think particularly with Him to Life it's those longer lines and um, the finished poem is is like quite a long poem. Um, in The Blue Towel, I think I wanted to include that one because I was, yeah, wanted to make this point about queer experience um, being part of the everyday of New York School poetry and I think um, you know, this is in you, at first glance, the poem is kind of very um, not subdued, but you know, minor, small, um, but it's also, you know, charged with this kind of intimacy and eroticism, the pearled skin, the kind of sucking crash of the waves, um, even, you know, that <laughs> that he talks about his lover's crotch and what it looks like with, with water splashing onto it. Um, the lines in um, the blue towel, it was late, no tan today, and watch the repetitions of the sea, each one different from the last. I think that gets at something that's um, in Skylar's poetry overall, the kind of watching of repetitions of the everyday reveals, how different and remarkable all our experiences are if we actually um, pay attention to them. There's no detail kind of too small all details, all moments are worthy of attention. Um, and this idea of a kind of egalitarian attention um, is something that I wanted to talk about too in terms of um, the everyday. Um, uh, we'll talk about duration and time, but we won't. Um, and I think that's, sorry. Um, yeah, we're back, you know, back in this idea of um, repetition, time and duration, which are bound up um, with how we understand the poem as a process rather than an object, um, something that happens alongside whatever else is happening. Um, yeah, the thing I want to say about Skylar and that is also um, in O'Hara's poetry in a different way is uh, the marking of time um, is sort of common um in Skylar it's often seasonal so in Him to Life he's talking a lot about plants growing and the cycle of the seasons and spring coming and winter and always kind of watching the seasons turning over in O'Hara it's um much more kind of time and date you know in you get these it's 12 20 it's 1959 it's 7 15 um so this attention to time is is um also like an attention to the momentary and to all the moments um, which the poem wants to take in. Um, and so that that brings me to this kind of important idea, I think, that's in all of the poets that I wanted to talk about tonight, which is um, r radical inclusivity, the idea that the poem can kind of try and contain it all, contain every, no moment is too small, um, no nothing too minor for the poem to kind of absorb and bring into um, bring into the fabric of the page. I think this is very different to like what Ezra Pound is talking about when um, he talks about the poetry containing history. 
um, because I think in that is a desire for the poem to be the authority on all of history. Um, and I think in the New York School poetry instead what we find is a much more open, um, non-hierarchical um, kind of attention, um, poems in which all objects and experiences, trivial and transcendence, um, are afforded their place. Um, Cataloguing the ordinary has the effect of revealing the strangeness and the ephemerality the humour or even, uh, it's a dubious word, but the luminousness or the luminous um, details um, of, you know, of experience in the world. Um, and so this idea of radical inclusivity, I think, is very, is important to how later generations um, of New York School poets write and construct their everyday and particularly um, women poets. Uh, as you as you probably noticed, the first generation in the first generation guest was kind of the sole um, woman poet writing, and I think guest um, you know certainly was marginal marginalized at times, um, both you know by within the literary scene and in and in scholarship and anthologies and things like that that were coming out of it. Um, her response was, I think, to look to women painters to kind of forge. Um, forge her own kind of um, canon or, or coterie um, of people that were interested in her work. Um, that That's sort of before, yeah, that's earlier. And then I think um, later, like in the 70s, you have people like the person on the screen now, Bernadette Mayer, um, Alice Notley, Eileen Miles coming in and kind of taking up um, the New York School sort of interest in radical inclusivity in um, in putting everything in the poem, um, but doing that through a much more explicitly um, feminist lens. So, um, yeah. So there's a relation. There's a clear relationship between um, you know the ideas of second wave feminism, which are becoming more prominent in the late '60s and '70s. Um, which sought to make visible the lives, work and experiences of women. Um, and so that, yeah, ties into this kind of open and egalitarian poetic inclusivity. The poem must, of course, then include um, women's experiences, thoughts, per you know, perspectives, bodies, lives. Um, so on that note, we, yeah, I thought I'd talk briefly about Bernadette Mayer's book, um, Midwinter Day, a book-length poem written on December 22, 1978. Um, the poem was conceived as a kind of performance experiment. Maya said, I had an idea to write a book that would prove the day like the dream, that would prove the day like the dream has everything in it. So again, a kind of connection between um, duration as duration constructing reality, the day and the dream contain everything um, and both the day and the dream then become the poem uh, which contains everything. Um, so yeah, it was written in a day and it's about um, it's about one day, a day of her life and that of her two young children and her husband Lewis Walsh um, in the town of Lenox, Massachusetts where they had recently moved from New York. Um, Alice Notley calls Midwinter Day an epic poem about a daily routine. Um, and Midwinter Day is kind of building on, um, going back here, earlier um, works like uh, Memory, which was a 1972 um, work that was um, installed in a gallery which comprised 1,200 colour photographs and seven hours of taped narration, which was the result of um, Mayer shooting one roll of film every day in July, every day um, of the month of July in 1971. She then mounted, the pictures were mounted chronologically and then she recorded narration which discussed um, each of the photos. So in theory you could sort of spend seven hours in the gallery and um, have this experience of, of Bernadette Mayer's month. Um, Okay, let's read some Midwinter Day. Sorry, I'm just going to get my copy of the book. Excuse my slightly dodgy scanning. I can see it's quarter two, so I'll read this and uh, then maybe we'll go to some um, 
questions in the last 10 minutes. <clears throat> Has no word or expression. Like the baby's desire to swallow all the eggshells, like nesting birds, the strollers make a roar. Except for cars, we practically see only white or black or grey today. We look and we see peripet peripatetic, like the police, the police. If it were noon, the noon siren would just have frightened us, voting the energetic town government so clean and full of men who make sure the eyes of the people, if nothing worse, avoid flashing and neon signs and flagrant cheap posters and designs, street vendors and the uncut grass. Um, and then just I wanted to read this section on the facing page. You've done all this before. Nothing happens. Let's go over it again. You walked around. We're turning near a home. We meet the librarian who's got an interesting hat. If it's not too cold or hot, we see the whole town every day, two square blocks with alleys, shortcuts, the town clock and two weathercocks. The Levin Tree, Seminis, the Crazy Horse, Lilac Park, the First Dentist, the Dramatic Post Office, the Academy Landmark, Amoco Station, Dr. Tosk's, Dr. Tosk's Loeb's Foot, Food Mart, Hagyard's Drugs, Mole and Mole, the Lennox Library, Whitestone Photo, two icy fire plugs, two banks, Curtis Hotel, Town Hall, Firehouse, Police Station, Dee's Department Store, Four Seasons, Travel, Bus Stop, Combination, Different Drummer, Coffee Break, Candlelight Inn, Gateway Inn, Community Centre, Kelly's Irish Inn, Paddlewicker Village Inn, etc., etc. So this long list um, on the facing page of the poem was one of the... Um, one of the interesting things about this poem in terms of um, a kind of demonstration of a radical inclusivity, it's just trying to kind of grab everything in the same way that, you know, shooting a roll of film is attempting to the impossible project of um, kind of cataloguing um, everything. And the other thing um, about Midwinter, of course, is that it is very much about, um, it's both about being a poet, I suppose, and being a parent. Um, the critic Andrew Epstein suggests that uh, this idea of the poetics of the maternal every day is a way which we could read um, a work like Midwinter Day um, and traces the influence of Bernadette Mayer on other poets like Claudia Rankin, Lainey Brown, Juan Nguyen and um, Kathy Wagner, I think also Sydney poet Astrid Lorange's book Labour. Um, but it is a work definitely where she's um, depicting her own kind of every negotiate, trying to negotiate feminist questions of motherhood and artistic poetic life and practice through this lens of um, daily repetitions, you know, nothing happens, you've done all this before, and then that keeps 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 happening um, in the book. Uh, poet and scholar Maggie Nelson has written that Mayer's work extends the New York School aesthetics of monstrous absorbency, which is a, a concept, um, actually, she's quoting Jeff Ward, so this monstrous absorbency, taking everything in, um, to include the many anxieties, frustrations, pleasures um, and desires which attend being or becoming a mother, mothering daughters, being a female writer and having a female body. And Nelson also writes that an abiding feature of Mayer's work is its relentless ability to remain interested where others' attention drops off and a refusal to be sated by the demarcations of reality as defined by others. So this, yeah, almost these ideas like monstrous absorbency and relentless attention, um, this really kind of close attention to the repetitions of the everyday which lead to um, which support this idea of radical inclusivity in which material that might not have um, previously been considered, you know, fit to, um, fit to constitute the poem um, are now making their way into the page. Um, I think it's 10 to 7, so I was going to talk a little bit about um, Joanne Kiger and Alice Notley. Perhaps we can do that afterwards in the chat, um, but there are also other names that I'd like to recommend, but I'll get out of the slideshow and we can get Lenny back on um, and see if there's a few questions. <clears throat> 
Thank you so much, Ella. That was uh, my. That was brilliant. I feel like all these parts of my brain are lighting up. I was uh, sort of really interested in a lot of the things you were saying, and I have a couple of things I want to kind of ask you about a bit more. But um, what I really liked was um, how you've kind of brought together all these, I guess, diff seemingly different kind of concepts of what the New York poets were trying to do, and actually through this lens of the everyday, we can see both how kind of specific it is as a way through to a poem as a poet and as a reader, but also how it kind of, uh, as a prism, goes out to all these other aspects like politics and lived experience and uh, time, which I'm going to ask you about a bit later. Um, but I don't know. I mean, you. I think you explained everything really well and uh I don't know if I have questions so much as like some ideas or thoughts I had while you were talking that I've kind of made notes about. Um, so it might be a question, it might just be an idea and you might have a, a uh, response or not. Um, can you, oh. oh, sorry, I might be frozen. Hmm. Can everyone hear me? Hmm. Okay, I think I'm back. All right, um, let's keep going, sorry. Uh, so the idea that you were talking about um, as this kind of poetry not being um, interested in catharsis um, in comparison to some of the other poets in that time period, but like a non-cathartic poetry and like a self-aware or ironic poetry. Um, was this kind of in reaction to the other poetry going on, do you think, or was there something in the nature of the social formation of these poets and the way their kind of friendships and maybe political sensibilities um, were shaping it? Sorry, Lenny. So I'm freezing again, aren't I? Um, I might just have to move. Sorry about this, everyone. Uh, <laughs> sure if it's on your end or my end. Um, um, this is fine. I'm just going to come into a different. Anti, being anti professional. <laughs> Sorry. This is the fun. Uh, oh. No, not at all. It's it seems it seems fine now. Look, okay, we're yeah. in a pandemic. I don't. <laughs> no, I think <laughs> this, this is like the best we can do. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I think I'll just recap that real quickly. Um, just uh, the um the idea of like yeah, yeah, anti-confessional. Um, look, I don't know if it was necessarily that they were reacting to or set against but I mean I think it was yeah why exactly I mean I think uh, I'm just trying to sorry gathering my thoughts I mean the no. the word that comes to mind I'm not sure why is kind of gossip and so I'm thinking of the the kind of New York school love of yeah the sociality and the the um the fact that kind of the art of good conversation is part of the art of being the poet. It is performative, I suppose, at times as well. And so, um, you know, the, po the poem is performative and that is also because the poem is a piece of performative and constructed language. And so they're poets who are interested in form in all sorts of ways, in art and in writing. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess if you're being performative, if you're trying to do something clever, you don't want to be, um, you know, it's not that emotion is boring. There's, and there's there's emotion and mood all through the poetry, but it's kind of, I guess it's just, um, it's not that interesting to just write exactly what you feel. <laughs> as a, It's not yeah. formally interesting. They're sort of trying to be, um, yeah, more formally interesting than that. Yeah, and I guess that's kind of also in response to 
their the influences in their own work on, in terms of modernism and um, the uh, the idea of that interest in the painterly process as well and that, the relationship of that to their poetry, um, which I think is really interesting. Um, I don't know if this is something... Yeah, ab abstract, abstract forms, I guess, yeah. might be one yeah. sort of way of thinking about why when when real experience and emotion enters it's not it's not um sort of it's not always given straight as it were <laughs> yeah and that something something like mood and tone can be like present in a poem in its making without it being kind of declared and there's a way of kind of yeah there's sort of different ways that mood appears in a poem and it's not always simply a kind of pontification about a feeling or moment mm. or something. Um, I wanted to also ask um, in terms of like, I, I, I liked the idea about what we were saying and how the poets in these um, circles were also kind of talking to painters and hanging out with painters and artists and that this idea of art um, making was like kind of central to their poetry making. Um, but this also kind of feels very particular, like so much of this is of that time in a way, like everything kind of feels of that moment. Um, do you have any ideas about why why that period is still kind of so enduring today and what do you think that they still say to us in terms of the like, like we're generationally and geographically quite different um, and far away, but like what is the kind of enduring appeal of these um yeah i mean i yeah i think it definitely is a product in a way of the time of of what was possible um in that particular moment that you know poets and artists could afford to live in a city like new york um the influx of migrants um, and refugees from europe bringing new ideas about um, art and culture and literature into the city, I think is also kind of um, mm. part of why that um, why that time is so enduring. Um, I mean, I, I just think you still, there's a lot of um, New York school poetry that you that you read now and it still feels very fresh and modern. like the things that they're trying um, the, the kind of, innovations and experiments in form um, remain remain um, of interest to us even though you know they're writing the early early poets are writing in a kind of analog moment and we've obviously you know the, the uptake of the digital um, has changed poetry in certain ways but um, mm -hmm. uh, what was my? I had a thought and then, <laughs> and then I just lost it. Um, I think, I mean, I, I think, I think the enduring appeal too is that they are, it is the direct and intimate and accessible way that they're writing that um, mm -hmm. remains kind of very appealing and, and the kind of freedom, um, the freedom mm -hmm. of expression that this kind of monstrous absorbency or, or radical inclusivity um gifts to a poet as a way of writing that that um you don't that you don't have to um i mean obviously i think they were that these poets were thinking about poetry all the time and reading widely and knew a lot about poems and were thinking about it but mm -hmm. that the act of writing itself um doesn't have to be this huge thing that you just build up to that it can be kind of built into your life and it can be um informal and spontaneous i guess that was yeah that that is that 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 was a break from um a lot of what modernism was all about and in the same way that i think modern you know modernist poetic experiment remains hugely influential to the way we think about the history of poetry um this kind of second iteration of doing formal experimentation but mm -hmm. um in a more um direct and immediate way um yeah mm -hmm. remains remains important and i mean i guess like 
yeah, thinking about the social and political and cultural um, kind of movements that New York School Poetry tracks alongside, I think there's there's still um, things that we're feeling the, um, you know, that feed into our present, basically. <laughs> Oh yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> you know, there are problems that people were tackling then that have not been solved, and people are still yeah. trying to tackle now. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. don't know if that answered the question. That was just no, a bit of a, no. A blast. That's great. No, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, we're we're at time now, so um, I'd like to thank you so much, Ella. That was uh, really informative and super interesting, and. I have definitely learned a lot. I hope everyone else has. Um, so thank you. And um, yeah, we'll call it a night there. My Bye, pleasure. Everyone. Thanks so much. Yeah. <laughs>